I don't know if there is like a specific format to these posts or something, but I'm just going to get straight into it. I'm posting this because, I don't know, maybe someone knows more about this. Maybe someone can help me figure out what happened to me and my best friend in the Holly Hills Mall parking garage. My name is Ethan, and my friend Aaron and I have a bit of a niche hobby. We're urban explorers. Basically, for the uninitiated, that just means we like to explore abandoned man-made structures. My favourites have always been places like water parks and theme parks. Aaron is more into the spooky stuff like hospitals and such. Huh. We can freak ourselves out at times, but for the most part, we never believed in anything other than the corporeal. We've been doing this in our free time for around ten years now, so we are pretty experienced. We know what to bring, how to avoid getting caught by the police or security, and when to get the fuck out of a place. Recently, we went to go visit my brother for a few days in Virginia. He just had a new baby and I wasn't able to make it down for the birth. So, I was making up for it a few months later. He lives in a small town called Holly Hills, about 30 minutes or so out from Richmond. It was a pretty boring place but my brother tipped us onto a cool spot to check out near town. An old abandoned mall, simply named the Holly Hills Mall. It was built in the early 80s by some wealthy lumber family that wanted to bring more people to the town. Houses need lumber, and that means more money for them. As you can guess, it didn't really work out. The mall was operational for about seven years before it shut down in 1987. I know none of this is really important, but this helps me get my thoughts in order. And honestly, the history of those structures is part of the allure for me. Anyway, we decided it would be fun and planned a trip on the last day in town on the way to the airport for a late flight. We woke up bright and early, packed our bags and supplies into the rental car, and said our goodbyes to my brother, his wife and their kids. The mall sat right on the edge of town. I thought this was odd, seeing as how they usually build that kind of thing central to town for ease of access, but I didn't think much of it. The mall was surrounded by pretty heavy brush and trees, as well as a tall chain-link fence. The entrance was blocked off by a typical dilapidated gate, held closed by a simple chain and padlock. Aaron pulled up to the gate, and I hopped out to apprise the situation. Oddly, the padlock wasn't even locked. Unusual, but not unseen. Sometimes people just stop giving a shit about these old places, and don't even check on them anymore. Honestly, it makes us a bit more relaxed in these situations, because it usually means no security. I opened the gate, and Aaron pulled the car through. The building wasn't the biggest mall we've seen, but it was bigger than we expected. We drove through the deserted parking lot and pulled the car up to the first entrance we saw. We grabbed our supplies and entered the building. The mall exploration itself was pretty uneventful. It was cool to see all of the ads and architecture that seemed frozen in time. Like we stepped back into a stale, post-apocalyptic version of the 80s. There was a pretty massive hole in the ceiling where the skylight had given way to snow or the elements or something. The tree that sat in the centre of the courtyard had grown massive and was protruding out of the hole in the ceiling. Aaron does these explorations for the fun of it, 
but I am a bit of an amateur photographer, so I do it for the photos mostly. I snapped a bunch of what I think would have been amazing photos, but unfortunately I lost the camera. Well, I didn't lose it, per se. I know exactly where it is. But we'll get to that. During the mall exploration, I did have a feeling that we were being watched. Distant sounds of glass crunching underfoot, or a figure just out of the corner of my eye that disappears right when you look in its direction. But I knew this was just my mind playing tricks on me. There were no signs of security, and no real reason that, even if the cops knew someone was in the building, they would even care to come check. At least, that was my thoughts on it. So I ignored it. We hung out in the food court for a bit, ate some sandwiches we packed for lunch, and then decided to make our way to the car. We got to the car, loaded up, and headed out. But on our way to the exit, we noticed a parking garage. It was a five-story garage from the looks of it, and though usually uninteresting, for some reason, Aaron wanted to check it out. We spent less time in the mall than we thought we would, so I figured, what the hell? We had the time. We entered the garage on the first floor, marked as floor zero. We drove up to floor four, did some donuts, and Aaron tried his best to reenact Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift on the way down. I was clenching the entire time, of course, because I didn't want to die. But, also, it was a rental car. We didn't have the money to pay for damage done by joyriding in an abandoned mall parking garage. We got back to floor zero, had a laugh, and started toward the exit. Until we noticed the ramp, heading down to a lower floor. Aaron pointed out how odd it was that there was a huge parking lot, plus a parking garage with five floors above ground, and seemingly subfloors below ground, for a fairly small mall in a small town. So, we thought, we'd make one more detour to see what was down there. Obviously, we were expecting either darkness or water. And... We found the first option. Darkness. Aaron turned on the brights and we drove around and found nothing. As expected. What we didn't expect was to see another ramp down to another sub-floor. So, of course, we decided to make a game of it. We both guessed how many sub-floors this garage had and Aaron headed down the ramp. I had guessed too, so this next floor should be the bottom. He said five. He was being stupid. But, imagine our surprise, when there was yet another sub-floor. We both laughed in disbelief when we came around the corner to the fourth sub-floor, to see a ramp down to the fifth. This is a ten-floor parking garage, including floor zero, for this mid-sized mall in this tiny town. What were they thinking? They really overestimated the draw that this place was going to have. Curiously, we headed down to sub-floor five. At this point, it was dark. Like, super dark. There was no other light from anywhere other than our headlights. We rounded the corner and were in silent awe to see yet another ramp going down. We both looked at each other, and I think one or both of us said, What the fuck? Without further discussion, Aaron steered the car down the ramp to the next floor. 
and for the next six floors we drove on in awe and confusion. We were now eleven floors underground. It didn't make sense. Aaron started coming up with theories, getting excited that maybe we'd found the entrance to a secret government base or a sprawling underground doomsday bunker. But he stopped mid-sentence when we both saw something we weren't expecting. A car. It was parked in a spot with its headlights on. As we pulled closer, I decided to roll down the window to see if I could hear anything. Immediately, the unexpected cold from the parking garage filled the car. It was mid-May at the time, and was a fairly warm day so the cold felt out of place. But we were underground, so I choked it up to that. I could hear the sound of our tyres against the pavement, and the hum of our car's engine. As we pulled up next to the parked car, I could hear that it, too, was running. The car itself looked like it was an older make, something from the 70s or 80s. Inside, it was seemingly empty. I suggested aloud that perhaps the car belonged to the owner of the property, or a security guard who was doing his rounds, and that he might be back at any minute. But Aaron pointed out, the car was covered in a thick coat of dust, like it had been there for a very long time. But it was running, I figured it just needed a wash. Aaron did what he does best, and convinced me to get out of the car and investigate further. Only after a bunch of protest and suggestions that we just head out. But he persisted. I exited and carefully made my way around the car, looking inside for any sign of life. But inside... There was nothing but leather car interior, except for the passenger seat, where a satchel sat, with a thermos resting on top. The keys were in the car, and the radio hummed softly with static. Oddly, everything inside the car also seemed to be covered in dust. Aaron urged me to open the door, and I decided to give it a try. But, of course, it was locked. I looked around the lot, only being able to see the door to the stairs and the elevators next to it, illuminated by the headlights of the two cars. I hurried back to our car, closed the door, and rolled up the windows. I urged once again for us to make our leave. If there was a security guard lurking around, I didn't want to have to deal with that especially before our flight in a few hours. Again, Aaron protested. He had to know how many floors this thing had. I can't say I wasn't curious as well. So, we left subfloor 11 and headed further down into the depths of the structure. We continued on in silence for 12 more floors, before I spoke up. This was... fucked. It didn't make any sense, and at this point, it just felt wrong. Dangerous. I was in the middle of expressing this to Aaron, when I noticed he had stopped the car, and was staring silently ahead. I looked, and was astonished to see... a horse... A fucking horse, just standing there. It had the thing around its nose, the reins or whatever, and it was just standing there. After a moment of staring in confusion, Aaron said something like, Is that a horse? And I replied with some sort of grunt of confirmation. The horse finally turned in our direction, and I'm pretty sure I screamed. 
when I saw the skin hanging off of the side of the horse's face. His skull exposed beneath. It was then I saw the blood on the floor, a large streak going from beneath the horse's hooves off into the darkness. I didn't want to know anymore. I wanted to get the fuck out of there, and I told Aaron as much. Aaron, against his and my better judgement, wanted to go on. He wanted to know what all of this was. But this time, I, I didn't let up. I was louder, and more insistent than I've probably ever been with him. And he could see that, I think. So he agreed, and threw the car into reverse. We backed up and started back up toward the ground floor. At this point, I decided to try my phone. I had figured I wouldn't get any signal underground. And I was right. But I tried it anyway. Nothing. Again, we drove in silence for a few floors. Aaron finally broke the silence to apologise, but I stopped him short. The floors were numbered. Ever since we started heading down, they were each numbered. B1, B2, B3, etc. We were on B23 when we turned around and headed back up. But the sign I was staring at in that moment said B26 three floors lower than when we started heading back up. I thought someone was fucking with us, but it was all too elaborate of a prank. Still, it was impossible. There was no way we were travelling further down by driving up the ramps. It was physically impossible. But there we were. Floor B-26. Aaron was just as confused as me, obviously. He got out of the car, unannounced, and walked over to the sign on the wall. He grabbed it and began to shake it, then stopped and stared, clearly trying to figure it all out. I rolled down my window and called for him to get back in the car. This was followed by another voice, repeating my words. Not mine, not Aaron's. He froze in place as the voice whispered loudly from the darkness. Get back in the car. Aaron did just that. He closed and locked the doors, and rolled up the windows. We agreed that we needed to get the fuck out of there. This wasn't fun or adventurous anymore, but we didn't know what to do. We thought we were getting out of there. I remember that we headed back up on B-23, and we decided that we should just keep going up. If the numbers keep rising, we should hit ground level by B-46. It didn't make any sense, but it was the best we had. We continued driving back up. Aaron was a bit quicker than before. And just as we thought, the numbers kept rising, which seemingly meant we were descending. But we held out hope that it was just some weird fluke. Maybe it was a joke. Maybe we didn't see those signs on the way down. We travelled in silence again, all the way to floor B-35. But it was an uneasy silence. We were afraid at every turn at what we might see. But there was nothing, mostly. There were a few floors with things that I did notice. Some of them subtle, others glaring. Aaron was focused on driving and didn't seem interested in any of the strangeness we encountered on those floors for the most part. On one floor... I swear I saw a long dining room table with two figures sitting at either end, illuminated for only a few seconds by our headlights. 
Another floor seemingly had a cot in each parking space. They looked to each be occupied by a body. Alive or dead. I don't know. One of the strangest, that even caused Aaron to stop the car for a moment, was a floor that didn't seem like a parking garage floor at all. It looked like we had pulled into a forest clearing. The pillars of the garage, now tree trunks, though the concrete ceiling was still visible above. There were plants, grass, bushes and a pathway leading to what looked like a small cabin in the distance. The window glowed as if there was someone home, and smoke seemingly billowed out of the chimney. The curiosity overcame my fear, and I rolled down the window. The sound of crickets, cicadas, and a cool spring breeze filled the car. Aaron and I looked at each other for a moment, before Aaron blurted out. Nah, fuck that. And continued on up the ramp. Finally, after what seemed longer than it should have, we reached the floor B46. Nothing. I started to cry. It was too much. The realization that we were lost, underground, without any way out, was starting to make me feel trapped. We were trapped. It was like I could suddenly feel the weight of every floor above us, on me, all at once. Aaron kept his call. He tried to console me. He tried to offer explanations. But there was no explanation. We were in the labyrinth of a parking garage, Aaron started driving with purpose. He turned around and started down again. B-47. B-48. B-49. He stopped the car, turned around again, and started driving back up the ramps. B-50. B-51. B-52. He started to scream. Anger. Frustration, confusion, all overflowing into a furious scream. Then, in a deafening echo, his scream reverberated around us, outside of the car, within the parking garage floor. The windows rattled, the car shook, and then shut off. We were now in pitch blackness. The interior of the car was only illuminated by my cell phone, which I had plugged in and had been charging. I picked up the phone and turned on the flashlight. Aaron was desperately trying to start the car. But there was nothing. Not even a click. Then he screamed again. This time in alarm. In front of us. In the darkness were two large eyes staring right at us. I have to express that when I say huge, they were massive, each seemingly the size of the wall. They felt almost flat and unnaturally still, but you could feel the consciousness behind them. Something was staring right at us. The whites were snow white, and the irises were an icy cold blue. The pupils were dilated and pitch black. I said fuck at least fifteen times in a row, and Aaron slammed his fists on the steering wheel, over and over. A voice, seemingly inside the car, whispered again. Good. Back in the car. Aaron's percussive maintenance seemed to have worked, because the car started back up, without him even turning the key. Whatever was down here seemed to want us to leave, and we wanted to leave too, but we didn't know how. 
Aaron put the car in reverse and spun it around. I could still see the eyes in the mirror. He sped up the ramp, totally disregarding the numbers. He drove a good six or seven floors before I noticed something standing out in the darkness. Each floor now had a dim light. I was able to calm Aaron down enough to listen to me, and I pointed it out. He stopped on the next floor to see the light in the distance. It was a door. The door to the stairs is illuminated by an emergency light above it. It was our only chance. It was our last option. He drove over and parked the car in front of the stairwell door, illuminating it fully with the headlights of the car. We both bolted out of the car. Aaron flung open the door, and we started running up the stairs. After the first flight, we saw the number on the stairs B-57. We were ascending. I started to tear up in excitement. We continued on, faster than before. For twenty floors, we basically ran, energized by the fact that the numbers were going down which meant we were going up. Around B30, we started to slow down pretty significantly. We were still making our way up, but we were tired. It was then that I looked back for the first time. The stairwell above us was lit on each floor, but as we made our way up to the next floor, the lights on the previous were turning off. Turning back to head up the stairs, I ran into Aaron who had stopped in front of me. He was looking up at the top of the next flight of stairs. I looked at what had stopped him. It was a person. A figure. Huddled in the corner at the top of the stairs. They sat with their head buried into the knees. Shaking. Their clothes seemed faded, old and dusty. Maybe a homeless person that had gotten lost. Maybe the driver of the vehicle. I called out gently to the stranger. Something along the lines of, Hello, are you okay? Do you need help? Aaron scoffed. He said we needed help. Screw this guy. He started up the stairs, but when he got near the top, he hugged the rail, facing the figure the entire time. Slowly, he rounded the corner and called me forward. The stranger didn't move. They just sat there, shaking, arms wrapped around their legs, face hidden. They were mumbling something, but I couldn't make out what it was. I followed Aaron's lead, and carefully passed the person. Same as before. No reaction. We moved on, leaving the figure behind. Aaron led as before, and when I made it to the top of the next flight of stairs, I looked back down, startled to see the gaunt face of a man, his cheeks sunken in his face pale and old, his eyes a piercing pale blue, staring at me, silent, unnaturally still. I didn't say anything. I slowly walked up and rounded the corner. He stared at me the whole time. Again, I ran into Aaron, who was looking up at the top of the next flight of stairs. It was a figure. It looked like the same stranger. I looked down at him on the previous floor, staring at me, and the next floor, face buried in his knees. We traded looks of what the fuck. But Aaron said, just ignore it and keep going. We're too close. So we did. 
Every floor after that, he was there, hiding his face as we approached, staring at us as we left. It was unexplainable, but so was everything else so far. We made our way up, finally reaching B1. This time, there was no man in the corner. I looked back to the previous top step, and he wasn't there either. I felt like this was a good sign for some reason. We made our way up to floor zero, and were relieved to see light shining through the cracks of the door. Aaron stopped for only a moment, and pushed through the door. He began to laugh. I followed him through, but the cold of the parking garage was back. There, before us, were the bright headlights of a car. Our car. Where we left it on floor B-58. I had no words. Aaron walked back into the stairwell and fell to the floor, distraught and broken. I told him we can just keep going. We could keep going up. But he wouldn't move. He was tired and defeated. His stoic bravery had finally given way to hopelessness and fear. So I decided to go up to the next floor to check it out. I ran up the stairs and I felt a sudden warmth. I could see the light through the cracks of the door, but I knew it was different. I knew it was the sun. I burst through and was blinded by the sudden light of the sun. After the hours and hours in darkness, it took a few moments for my eyes to adjust. We had made it. We were free. We were alive. I ran back down to the previous floor to tell Aaron, but... He was gone. I ran out through the door, into the garage to check on the car. But he was nowhere to be seen. I called for him, shouted at the top of my lungs. My voice echoed through the parking garage. But nothing. I didn't know what to do. I started down the stairs, but stopped cold. I couldn't go back down. I couldn't get lost down there again. And then I saw, on the top stair of the floor below, the figure was back. It was Aaron, sitting in the corner, his hands wrapped around his knees, staring at me. I called to him. I ran down to him. But when I got to the stair, he was gone. I looked over the railing down at the next flight, and there he was again, staring. I couldn't go down any more. I couldn't. I called to him, pleaded with him to come to me, to get it together and get the fuck out of there. But he just stared. I promised him I would come back. I cried as I turned around and made my way out of the garage, as I left my best friend behind to save myself, because I was too scared. I ran from the parking garage, across the parking lot, past the gates, and to the road. Finally, my phone had a signal, and I called the police. They came out, and I tried my best to explain what happened. I knew it sounded crazy, but I told them the truth. They went and checked out the parking garage. They searched the entire thing, as well as the mall and the surrounding area. Nothing. In fact, they told me there were no subfloors in that garage. Like I dreamt it all up. How the fuck could that even be? 
I was tested for alcohol and drugs, and fined for trespassing. When my brother arrived to pick me up, I tried my best to explain what happened, but if it couldn't get any weirder, he swore to me he didn't know who Aaron was. They've known each other since we were kids. He's been my best friend for 20 years. But he swore. His wife too, and kids. None of them remembered him. After that, I looked for any evidence of Aaron I could find. All the pictures on my phone were gone. My camera was still in the car and there was no proof of his existence online, anywhere. I didn't dream him up. I don't do drugs, I don't drink, I don't have any history of mental illness. I didn't make up 20 years of friendship. I've been seeing a therapist, and started some meds. It hasn't helped. Nothing has. Something doesn't feel right. This world doesn't feel right. Like I came out of that parking garage into a life I didn't own. I feel like I don't belong here. Every day it becomes more and more clear to me that I have to go back. I don't know what I wanted to get from this post. Maybe to just tell my story, for people to know I existed, Aaron existed. Maybe to find someone who knows what happened to us, who knows something about the Holly Hills more, who can make any sense of it. Either way, I have to go back, I have to find Aaron. We have to get back in the car.